<coughs> Hello, welcome to part two of our lecture on the vision, vision and visual systems. Um, last time we talked about properties of light. Today we're going to talk about structures and functions of the eye. So this is a basic cross-section of the human eye. It has a number of important parts for us to talk about. We'll talk about these individually, but uh, to give you an idea, light enters at the first striking the cornea. Light rays are then refracted and bent in order to try to focus them back here on the fovea. They pass through the pupil, which is larger or smaller based on the constriction or contraction of the iris muscles. Passing then through the lens, where light is further focused uh, for close-up or far-away objects based on the shape of the lens that's pulled to a different shape based on the um, ciliary muscles conducted by the zonule fibers. Light then strikes the retina here at the back of the eye, transduction occurs here, and uh, nervous signals then exit the eye via the optic nerve. So we'll take each of these structures one by one. The first is the cornea. The cornea is the exterior surface of the eye. The cornea has a number of important properties. Uh, it is highly innervated with pain receptors. Anyone who's ever either scratched their cornea or gotten something caught in their eye knows how painful that can be. Uh, so this is highly innervated with pain receptors. It's also one of the fastest growing tissues in the body. Importantly, the cornea does not have its own blood supply, so it collects oxygen from the environment. So if you wear contact lenses, one of the problems with contact lenses is that they block that collection of oxygen from the environment, which is why doctors encourage you not to wear your contacts all the time so your cornea can get uh, a little bit of a break. If you wear toric lenses due to an astigmatism, those can be particularly problematic because they're a little bit heavier on the bottom and these cells here at the bottom of the cornea can start to grow outwards trying to reach oxygen. So it's important to uh, maintain your eye health by letting them collect some oxygen now and then and giving them a break. The primary function of the cornea is refraction. And refraction is simply the bending of light rays. So this is the uh, primary perceptual function of the cornea. Uh, light strikes the cornea and they are bent significantly to get them focused on the uh, back of the retina, in particular right here at the fovea. It's this air cornea difference that allows for a significant amount of refraction. So what happens is uh, light rays strike, say, water or the cornea, and then they're bent or refracted a certain amount. The difference between air and our cornea allows for proper refraction. Our corneas are not different enough from water to allow significant amounts of, of refraction. This is why we can't see underwater uh, without something like goggles. Goggles actually reinstates that air cornea difference and allows us to then see underwater. So the major function of the cornea is to help us focus light on the back of the retina so that we can actually see what we're looking at. So this is an example of refraction. You can see this pencil doesn't look straight because the light rays are getting bent differently from air versus water. And that's exactly what the cornea is doing. So that amount of refraction, again, is related to the air cornea difference. And that's, again, why we see poorly underwater. Uh, we can reinstate that with swim goggles. Some species, like the alligator, actually have uh, ways to adapt for that. They can actually close an inner eyelid to see underwater and then open that to see above water. Uh, there are other species that have adapted this problem even further. There is a species of fish called the anableep anableep. And the anableep anableep actually has a split cornea so that while it's skimming along the water, it can actually see below water and above water at the same time. So it can see both predators and preys all at once. The iris is the next part of the eye to talk about. This is the colored ring that determines the color of our eyes. It's actually a ring of muscle tissue, and its function is to control uh, the size of the pupil. So it can expand and contract to let more or less light into the um, rest of the eye, to let more light pass. So the iris has an important function in controlling pupil size. The pupil is, of course, the adjustable opening at the center of the eye. It controls the amount of light entering the eye. A number of important things to understand about the pupil. 
first of all, we have what's called a consensual pupil error response. That is, when one pupil expands, the other one expands at the same time. So both of them should be expanding and contracting at the same rate. This is why you see uh, doctors, ambulance drivers, etc., shining a light in one eye of a patient with a head injury to determine whether or not uh, there is uh, damage to the part of the brain that's responsible for this consensual pupil error response. So they should both respond the same way. The pupil is also an important social cue. Our pupils actually dilate a bit uh, when we're attracted to somebody. And as a result, in the 1920s, women used to put belladonna in their eyes to make their pupils very large, so it looked like they were always interested in someone. Uh, so this is an important social cue that allows us to have some idea whether or not someone might be attracted to us. This is also part of the sympathetic nervous system response. When our sympathetic nervous system engages, our pupils dilate so that we can gather as much light as possible. The lens is the next structure. This is a transparent structure that changes shape to focus light on the retina. The ciliary muscles pull the lens to change its shape. Uh, this allows us to focus on near or far objects or proximal or distal objects. So the lens is most relaxed when looking at distal objects, so far away objects, and it's most uh, pushed when looking at proximal objects. So one of the things that uh, is important to understand, the more close-up work you do, the harder it is on your lens. So you need to give your eyes a little bit of a break to try to relax a little bit. As we get older, the lens starts to lose its ability to change shape, and we develop what's called presbyopia, and that uh, is basically nearsightedness due to the fact that our lenses can no longer change shape enough to focus on near objects. So some of you may have noticed yourself or your parents or friends holding their phones further and further away until they eventually have to give up and eventually get reading glasses. This is simply due to the change in the flexibility of this part of the eye. So a little closer look at this, distant vision, uh, everything's relaxed, these muscles push to change the shape of the lens to get us to focus on things close up. This process is called accommodation. So when we accommodate, we are changing our focus to either near or far objects. So when the lens changes shape, we call that accommodation. Acuity refers to the sharpness of our vision. We can either have perfectly sharp vision, be nearsighted, farsighted, or can suffer from what's called presbyopia, which literally means old eyes. So nearsighted is myopia. Light is focused in front of the retina. We can see close up, but not far away. People who are farsighted, hyperopia. Light is focused behind the, met the retina, and these people can see things that are close up. Sorry things that are <laughs> um, far away, but things that are not close up. And so these are people you often see trying to hold things out further and further away so they can actually see them. So that's nearsightedness and farsightedness. These are, of course, corrected with different kinds of convex and concave lenses. I do want to note for a moment that pupil size is related to accommodation. There's a tribe called the Moken who have actually trained themselves to change their pupil size so they can actually see underwater. And essentially what they do is they constrict their pupils so that they can see more easily underwater, as you can see here. The take home message from this is that you should always, always read in bright light because the further open your pupils are, the harder it is for your eyes to focus um, on the retina. And so a smaller pupil actually helps you see more easily. And so you always want to use bright light. The final note on acuity is presbyopia. And presbyopia, again, unfortunately means old eyes. As you start to reach um, 40s to mid 40s, your lens becomes thick and less elastic, and you're less able to accommodate. And so as a result, people become uh, a little bit nearsighted. And this is one of those things that laser correction cannot fix. You really absolutely need um, reading glasses for this. The other thing that happens as we get older is we get changes to color perception and um, our sensitivity. Older adults really need high contrast, black on white, 
Uh, they have a hard time seeing in the blue and yellows uh, because of changes in both the lens and uh, changes in uh, their retina as well. The retina is at the back of the eye and was where all the really action is. That's where transduction occurs. This is where light gets turned into neural energy. It's highly vascular. In fact, it's one of the most highly vascular surfaces of the body, so it uses a lot of blood. Light actually passes through several layers of neurons to reach the photoreceptors before phototransduction occurs. So there are several layers of light uh, through which, uh, sorry, several layers of neurons through which light passes. So you can see here, light is passing through the ganglion cells, amacrine cells, bipolar cells, horizontal cells to reach the actual receptors, which include um, rods and cones. So this is all a transparent layer of cells, and then neural energy travels back up through these cells to travel towards the brain. <coughs> Excuse me. This is a picture of actually my retina uh, I got from my eye doctor. You can see here the optic nerve is this very clear spot where both blood vessels and uh, nervous cells are exiting the retina. And then here, this very dark area is what we call the fovea. And this is where most of our perception occurs. This is where most of the cones occur. And this is where we're gener generally trying to focus light. So light passes through those layers of neurons to reach the photoreceptors. The photoreceptors are embedded in a tissue called the pigment epithelium. And this is where they get all of their nutrition from, uh, where they uh, regenerate based on nutrition from uh, that uh, pigment epithelium. There are two different kinds of photoreceptors in the retina. These include uh, rods and cones. And so you can see here uh, the photoreceptors embedded in the pigment epithelium. The rods uh, only detect the presence or absence of light. They function only under conditions of low illumination. So generally at night, uh, it takes about 30 minutes or so for the rods to really start functioning. We call that dark adaptation, which is why it usually takes us a while to see very well at night. They tend to be involved in our perception of motion because they do cover the entire retina aside from the fovea. And so things that are moving across our peripheral retina, we can see that movement using our rods. They do not discriminate color or have any level of detail. A lot of that has to do with their level of neural convergence. And we'll talk more about that uh, later on. And they only occur in the periphery. So there are no rods in the fovea. The fovea consi consists entirely of cones. Those cones are what are responsible for our detailed perception and our ability to see in color and high detail. Those cones, then, are uh, three different types in most humans. The short, medium, and long wavelength cones, which are sometimes called the blue, green, and red cones. Each absorbs light at specific wavelengths. These are associated with color vision, uh, detailed vision, so anytime you're reading, uh, bringing in any kind of detail, the cones are at work. They are not as sensitive to light, so they function at higher levels of illumination only, so daylight, bright light. Uh, the cones are what are primarily active. And they're located primarily in the fovea. And the fovea is an indentation in the back of the retina that's contained within what's called the macula. Some of you may have heard of what's called macular degeneration. It's something we'll talk about later on. But it's essentially degeneration of the neurons in this part of the retina. And so this is where all of our detailed perception occurs. So the fovea is this indentation in the central retina. It's densely packed with cones. Light is focused here for detailed vision, and there are no rods in the fovea. Uh, this is where the cornea and the lens are working to focus light in this little indentation. This is what allows us to see anything, anytime we're looking right at something that's getting put right in that fovea. So this is a really important part of the retina for our perceptual abilities. The optic nerve, then, is a bundle of cells which exit the eye as the optic tract, transmits signals from the retina to the thalamus to what's called the lateral geniculate nucleus. Um, so all of these um, photoreceptors, all of their information exits the eye via this optic nerve, which is also called the optic disc. This is that part that you saw in my retina that was very bright. 
there is there are no photoreceptors in this area so this is actually what we call our blind spot so this optic disc is an area where the optic nerve exits this is on the nasal side of your eye that is it's closest to your nose there's no photoreceptors here and the reason we don't notice this uh, is of course there is a matched part of this visual field in our other eye but even if you close one eye you don't see some blank spot in your visual field what happens is your brain fills in the surrounding area. And you can look up online a number of demonstrations about how this works to see how uh, you might uh, be able to see something disappear into that uh, blind spot. So I recommend doing that sort of thing. The last stop in our tour of the retina are the um, neural cell layers. So this is kind of the layers that light passes through and then neural energy once light um, gets transduced by the photoreceptors, it goes back up through the cell layer. It includes this inner nuclear layer, which is bipolar, horizontal, and amacrine cells. The ganglion cell layer, all information leaves the retina via these ganglion cells. These cells exit via the optic nerve and then synapse at the lateral geniculate nucleus of the thalamus. And so this starts to build the visual pathway. So uh, let's take a look at these different kinds of neurons within uh, the retina. We have receptors which transduce light into a neural signal. These include the rods and cones. These have different perceptual properties. We have horizontal cells, bipolar cells, amacrine cells, and the retinal ganglion cells. These um, crosstalk in a variety of different ways. Uh, we'll talk mostly about how the retinal ganglion cells are associated with receptive fields and associated with a small degree or large degree of spatial summation. The last part of the eye to talk about are just some other important notes. The sclera is the, out, out, the outer part of the eye and then the aqueous and vitreous humor are the uh, fluids within the eye and an imbalance of these can result in um, diseases like glaucoma. So we'll talk more about those when we talk about uh, different diseases of the eye. So that's your introduction to uh, the structures and functions of the eye.